Okay, I'm Doug Thomas, and I'm the president of Secular Connection Secular, uh, and I'm here at the world the uh, conference simply because I want to help my fellow atheists understand uh, some of the the, uh, the things that are going on. Uh, I became an atheist by way of being an agnostic. I discovered there was no evidence for the existence of God, so I don't believe in it. Nation of Islam returning to Detroit Mecca. The Nation of Islam usually holds its annual rally in Chicago, but this year it decided to hold the rally in Detroit, the city where it was founded. Known as Savior's Day by the group's members, it commemorates the birthday of the nation's founder, Wallace Muhammad. Detroit is the Nation of Islam's Mecca, said student minister Troy Muhammad, who leads the Detroit chapter. Master Fard Muhammad met Elijah Muhammad, and out of that meeting you have Malcolm X, you have a Muhammad Ali, you have the Million Man March, and you have Minister Farrakhan, said Troy Muhammad. All these significant people came out of that meeting in 1930, so that's why we call Detroit our Mecca. The Nation of Islam is the largest black nationalist organization still in existence today, so it's significant that the rally is being held in Detroit, a city whose population is 79% African American. The group's leader, Minister Louis Farrakhan, has been encouraging Nation of Islam members, as well as others in the black community, to move to Detroit and invest in the city. Farrakhan's message of black self-empowerment resonates with many in Detroit, attracting crowds that go well beyond his Muslim base, often drawing standing room only crowds in the churches and arena he speaks at. This year, Farrakhan has created controversy and drawn criticism even from his own followers. In a radio interview with Alex Jones, Farrakhan seemed sympathetic to Trump's aggressive plans regarding the policing of Muslims entering the United States, and he visited Iran last week, meeting with Iran's former foreign minister and praising the Islamic Revolution in Iran. As is often the case when culture, ethnicity, and religion become intertwined, it can be nearly impossible to tease them apart. Many within the African American community appreciate the efforts of Nation Islam to promote economic and social justice, as well as the role it played during the Civil Rights Movement, but find its evangelism of Islam off-putting. There's been much speculation by observers as to the direction and future of the group after Farrakhan, who is 82, dies or steps down as leader. However, for the time being, he appears healthy and gives regular speeches. Regardless of the leader's polarizing comments, many Detroit residents appreciate everything the Nation of Islam is trying to do for their community. Two U.S. gynecologists urge compromise on female genital mutilation. Two U.S. gynecologists published a hotly challenged paper in the Journal of Medical Ethics suggesting Western countries should allow immigrant communities to surgically nick young girls' vaginas as an alternative to female genital mutilation. The pair asserts that such a compromise could allow groups to honor cultural and religious prescripts while saving girls from invasive and disfiguring dis genital slashing. Female genital mutilation is practiced in at least 30 countries located in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East and is closely tied to religious views. It can range from a small cut to the vagina to complete removal of the clitoris and labia, which is then often stitched closed, leaving only a small hole for urination, menstruation, and intercourse. According to the World Health Organization, about 3 million girls a year are victim of genital mutilation and as a result often experience harmful side effects such as infection, urinary difficulties, cysts, infertility, complications in childbirth, and the inability to achieve orgasm and fatal bleeding. Among the cultures that practice it, vaginal cutting is widely regarded as a libido reducer intended to keep a woman chaste, and many believe that it is the only way to ensure the moral or ritual purity of their child. In the U.S. papers, the authors state we are not arguing that any procedure on the female genitalia is desirable. Rather, we only argue that certain procedures ought to be tolerated by liberal societies, which have outlawed such practices but host immigrants for whom it is part of their culture. The duo went on to make the case that efforts to enforce such an outright ban have led to the paradoxical effect of driving the practice underground, putting young girls at even greater risk. But peers immediately pushed back, dismissing the idea. Ariane Chavisi of the University of Sussex Ethics Department countered, one must not cause irreversible change to the body of another without their consent. Setting aside the fact that it's unclear whether or not this type of procedure suggested in the paper would even be considered a valid alternative by the communities performing vaginal cutting, there's a larger issue here. Compromising on this would set a terrible precedent. Though female genital mutilation is practiced by people of multiple religions, the populations that engage in it are overwhelmingly Muslim. In several hadiths, sayings attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, it is praised as noble. Though it should be noted that many Muslims disagree strongly with female genital cutting, it doesn't change the fact that those inflicting this practice on their children justify it by citing religion or culture. Canada's leaders consider future of religious freedom ambassador position. 
Canada's new Liberal government is extending the term of current Religious Freedom Ambassador Andrew Bennett for a few short weeks as it considers the ultimate direction of the position. Foreign Affairs Minister Stefan Dion recently told the press that Bennett's duration will be extended until at least the end of March as the government weighs how best to preserve and protect all human rights, including that vital freedom of religion or belief. Many, however, see it as a sign that the office is on the chopping block. At a foreign policy conference last month, Dion said that the Liberal government will continue to champion religious freedoms abroad, but that religious freedoms should not be disconnected from other universal rights. Human rights are interdependent, universal, and indivisible, he said at the time. How can you enjoy the freedom of religion if you don't have the freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, or freedom of mobility? However, several religious groups have been critical, asking that the government allow the office to continue its work and claiming that the mandate is more important now than ever due to the role of religion in geopolitics.